Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Hoshonda Sanders, and I'm here with T. Kira Madden, uh, who's the author of the new beautiful memoir, um, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you Pupster so much for Diversity. having me. Yes, such a, such a pleasure. Um, I wanted to start by asking you about your name, because I think that a lot of people think maybe that your first initial is an initial but it's actually your first name could you talk a little bit about that and like sure there is no period uh, my name is Tikira uh, my mother she was a single mother when she was pregnant with me and my aunt whose name is Tammy took her in and her children all of their names began with T as well and my mom was reading Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby and she liked the the power and authority she felt F. Scott held. And she wanted to use that for, for women, for women empowerment. She was in a house with women who took her in. And since their names began with T, she decided to put a T in front. It doesn't stand for another name. It's just a letter. And she wanted it to be kind of this, a symbol of womanhood and taking care of each other. And Kira comes from the 1980s terrible movie, Xanadu. Hannah do. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Yes. I'm always curious about how people get their name, um, especially when they're unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and so let that be a lesson to those of you who want to put a period after T. It, there is no period. Um, tell me about um, what you mentioned your mom. Um, in the book, there is this, uh, there's kind of like a, a, a heaviness and a lightness when it comes to your parents. Um, was it difficult for you to, to mine um, those stories uh, to, to write the memoir? In the beginning, it, it was really difficult because I had just lost my father. I started writing this book about two months after his passing at a writing res residency. And I was going to work on a work of fiction, a novel. Um, I'd been working in fiction for many years, and that's what I studied, it's what I taught, it's what I wrote. So it really surprised me. I always say this book kind of happened to me because I was in this state of grief and working through some questions I still had. And I just, I felt I didn't have a, a choice but to write about what was, what had charge. And in the moment, it, were, it was those questions. It wasn't the novel. Mm -hmm. um, so it was difficult at the time. Of course, I had just lost him. But then when it came to later crafting the book outside that grief period of sort of journaling when I was crafting the pieces. Um, that is never the most difficult part for me. That's elevating experience to a new plane. Mm -hmm. It's it's rendering it as art, which, which does feel better mm -hmm. in a way. The conversation surrounding the events in the book, that's what's difficult mm -hmm. and that's what feels prickly still. But the, the writing itself is is something higher. Um, yeah, it's if almost that makes like, sense. Yeah, it's almost like an alchemy, right? We feel mm -hmm. like you can transform or transmute these things that have happened yes. into a different form. Yes, yeah. transformation. That's always what I'm going for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I mean, it's hugely affecting in the book. Um, I wondered about... Um, you know, the, the people who might still be living in your family and, mm -hmm. and their reaction and and um, whether or not you were able to either sort of block them out when you were writing or um, or if, if they were very much, you know, sort of present as you were mm -hmm. trying to write the book. I think for me, and I think everyone is different, and that's what I really learned through writing nonfiction, that no one set of rules applies to all. And yeah. I was really looking for those answers as a person writing a work of nonfiction for the first time. I went to my mentors and teachers and writers like, who, whose permission do you ask? How do I go about this? And everyone had different answers mm -hmm. that apply in different ways for their families and their friends. Mm -hmm. But for me, I wanted to do the opposite of blocking everyone out. I wanted to let everyone in mm -hmm. for the first time in yeah. some ways. I really wanted to have conversations that we hadn't had before in my family, bring things to light, bring things into the room, um, to sort of dissipate the shame that has surrounded many of the topics mm -hmm. in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I just really wanted to hear everyone and mm -hmm. hear their stories. And it was actually really beautiful to hear how differently people remembered the same thing. I think in the beginning I was chasing accuracy and I was chasing getting it right. And through 
by having these conversations, I realized you can't get it right. Everyone remembers things with a different texture, with different um, layers of understanding based on their own experience and what they bring to it. And the best I could do is just try to bring my experience to it and be honest uh, with the people I wrote about, have those difficult conversations, and always check myself and my own intentions of why I was writing a person or scene, um, and that my intentions always remained noble and fair, and I wanted to render everyone as, as fully dimensionally as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love the author's note at the beginning of the book where you, you um, talk about like how uh, much extensive research is involved in, in, uh, in your writing process, but also just how memory is altered by the person who kind of lives the story, mm -hmm. um, and I think that was such a, a wonderful way to put it. Um, you know, you've drawn comparisons to Dorothy Allison and uh, Lydia Yeknovich, whose name I'm probably butchering. <laughs> Sorry, Lydia. Um, but um, oh, did you draw inspiration from those memoirist, essayist, writers, um, in addition to others, um, as you thought about the, the structure of the book and also um, the topics of the book? Absolutely. I think everything I write, or everything we write as writers, is is informed by everything we've read before. I think the the idea that everything we write is completely isolated in our own kind of realm of thought is a romantic idea, but an untrue one. I don't think it's really possible to write from a place of complete purity outside of our experiences. And as readers, or sorry, as writers, that includes everything we've read before. But for me, I think that's the most beautiful thing about writing. It's almost like this this echo that kind of rings through time when we're using, um, and I'm not saying copying, but the same turn of phrase or structure that we've seen in the past, it's keeping those works alive and breathing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's beautiful to always be nodding to those people who, who came before us and made it possible. Um, Lydia's book, Chronology of Water, was definitely very important for me writing this book. Um, it gave me permission in ways. Uh, I didn't realize I needed that permission, but permission to to fracture my story and not follow a traditional plot arc, um, to try to mirror the experience of the living through the writing mm -hmm. instead of trying to neaten it and tidy it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that was a misconception I had about the memoir form. Mm -hmm. Again, I studied fiction. Mm -hmm. so. Through fiction, I learned about experimentation and form, but through reading memoir for the first time as I was writing memoir and catching up on my education, I realized, oh, this is actually breaking form in really interesting ways as well. The idea that it has to be linear, chronological, traditional, that it has to be a whole sprawl of a lifetime is a very untrue one. Mm -hmm. It's usually just a gendered idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm, great. I'm glad you brought that up in terms of the chron chronology of water and also like, um, experimenting with form because your your memoir is in three different parts, mm -hmm. um, and um, in the I, I was interested in in the kind of reverse chronology of it, mm -hmm. um, and 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 why you made that decision. Um, it sounds like your it feels like your family history um, is at the end, and and possibly I think the shortest part of the book, and then um, there are these earlier memories that put you at the center, um, even though um, in the writing it comes. Across Cross as uh, as though you were quite um, unprotected um, and, and maybe uh, sort of left to your own devices um, uh, and experienced a lot of tragedy as a, as a result of that or a lot of difficulties uh, because of that. Um, so could you, uh, how, did, how did you decide that you would, you know, uh, organize the material? It was a long process, for sure. In the beginning, it was really fractured essays with with no linearity at all, no order. Um, then I tried thematic sections, breaking things down into family, friends, sexuality, race, privilege. And I do recommend that for anyone who's organizing pieces mm -hmm. because once I organized those columns thematically, I was able to to choose what I felt was working the best, what was hitting the highest note in within each of those sections, mm -hmm. and then organize the weight by, by that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized I, I liked the three-act structure because I wanted there to be 
I wanted the implicit drama of different versions of the self. I do have external drama, um, external conflict, of course, but I love the idea, the kind of Samuel Beckett, Craps Last Tape version of the greatest drama being the past, present, and future self. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted those definitive sections in that way. The first section of my book is me as a child, the middle is kind of teenage coming of age years, and then me present day along with my mother's story. Once I made the discoveries that I find in the last section of the book, I realized I had to go into my mother's story. Mm -hmm. And once I understood her story better, I realized we actually lived these parallel lives and the book was actually about generational trauma and generational echoes more than I thought it was. Mm -hmm. I had to widen the scope mm -hmm. in order for the book to find its landing, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some other folks have questions for you, so I won't, um, I won't keep you all to myself with my questions, but um, I, was t I was taken by um, the diversity of your, of your experience, not just as an you know, APA, APIA writer, but also as a queer woman. Um, could you talk about like w what writing the memoir offered you in terms of um, either coming into or exploring those stories? I know you write in the acknowledgments about um, the book being for you know queer women um, in particular who never get to see their stories, um, and the way that you render those stories are so beautiful in the book. Um, but there's also you know this beautiful heritage and lineage um, that you know touches Hawaii and touches Florida, and you know is is like quite literally like an Asian Pacific Islander story. You know, mm -hmm. um, so. Um, yeah, if you just talk about like why why those things were important for you to, to really delve into in your story. Not just the, the trauma, but the, the beauty of these um, multiple identities. Sure. I think the book is very much about um, our search for our belonging that I think most of us can relate to in some way. Um, finding that community, finding that family, whether it's, you know, I, I often sign books to Ohana, both lost and found, or blood and found, mm -hmm. Ohana being uh, the Hawaiian word for family. And in Hawaii, you know, everybody is auntie, uncle, anyone who takes you in, yeah. um, anyone, you know, these are my people, those are your aunties, your uncles, your cousins, and that's, that's how it, it works yeah. in Hawaii, and that yeah. confuses people who come and visit. They're like, how many aunties do you have? Right. Right. <laughs> But um, I do think the book is, is reaching for that and trying to find it in different corners of our lives and our failures to find that community and also our triumphs. And I hope the book is, is a gesture, it is a love letter to those people. Um, and I think I have found community through the publication of it. I personally, I, I don't write for myself mm -hmm. and I know some people do and I think that's fantastic, but I think it's just as noble to write for other people, um, mm -hmm. for that outreach, for that, for that communication through a page, um, to find your people in that way. On the same note, I also never want to be, um, and of course I don't posit to be, but I never want to be the voice of a certain demographic, and I, I just want to be one voice yes. in, a, in a chorus, yes. essentially. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's so important to say, especially because representation is so important and mm -hmm. there's not enough of it. So that once you see one story and you're like, that story is like my story, but like maybe for someone who hasn't read that story before, they think it represents an entire community. And you're like, you know, mm -hmm. I am I'm one. I get to be part of a chorus. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, also, Ohana, that idea about like aunties and uncles is very much an African-American, you know, fictive kin um, <laughs> construct as well. So I can completely relate to that. Um, and, and this idea of belonging very much um, is a theme, you know, one of the many like important themes in your memoir. So I think that you absolutely hit it. Thank you. Um, okay, so Nathaniel asks, did you always want to write a memoir? I never wanted to write a memoir, <laughs> Nathaniel. <laughs> I was a fiction writer through and through. That was my interest. Um, and my fiction, it never had anything to do with my life. Um, I'm sort of embarrassed to say in graduate school, if you talk to anyone I went to graduate school with, I only wrote fiction stories from the point of view of white straight men. Mm. And I had this idea that that was the only way I could write my stories about sex with muscular language, with 
it was this really false idea that was how I would be taken seriously, mm -hmm. that I could get this voice. Because I didn't understand, I didn't see the validity in my own identity and my own stories. Um, and then I started getting into sci-fi genre work in, in a way to kind of break that, what I was doing. And it wasn't until I really accidentally wrote this book that I realized, oh, here's my power. This is the charge. Um, I need to write into and for these identities. Mm -hmm. and, and now my fiction reflects that as well. Um, I think it's ra like radically changed in the last few years. But I never intended to write a memoir. It seemed really scary to me. And I think that's also, it was my, my ignorance about what the memoir form was because I had only known those kind of white, straight, male memoirs. Mm -hmm. That's what I had read in school. So I had this, like, who would want this kind of sloppy, messy, broken, experimental memoir from me um, at 27 years old. I was told I, I was never old enough to write memoir when I took a memoir class when I was a teenager. And that really got in my head, and I thought it was true. And it wasn't until I started reading memoir and educating myself and catching up that I realized it's doing some of the most interesting, making some of the more interesting formative choices, um, so many different people are writing into memoir, and and it can look any way you want it to look. And also, you know, everyone looks to Didion's, you know, the year of magical thinking, for example. That's one year of a person's life right. focused on one experience. So the idea that it must be the great sprawl of a lived life is is completely untrue. Right. We just have to distill a single experience in some cases in a way that translates to right. other people. Right, and make it universal. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's an ages, sexist, racist, everything in the book idea of what memoir should be. Absolutely, and yeah. whose stories are important enough exactly. to be told exactly. and, and those things. So in, I, I agree with you in that writing can be like a social, a sociopolitical act, if you will. Absolutely, and I think it always is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you made me think about um, Claire Bay Watkins' uh, lecture and essay on pandering mm -hmm. when you were talking about your experience yes. at graduate school, um, writing from a white male perspective, I could see how it would be both empowering and also disempowering, mm -hmm. probably. Absolutely. And I love Claire Day Watkins. I yeah. think she's a genius. Yeah, she is. Okay, Jake asks, how does your experience being a member of the queer community influence your writing? Hmm. I think it I think my, my gayness, my queerness inspires me to, again, break that traditional form, uh, to queer the form, if you will. I think there is pressure for queer people to always write in a more kind of hero's journey or Genesis story kind mm -hmm. of way of A, B, C, you know, this is when I found out I was gay, this is what happened, and here's my tragic ending or my triumph. Mm -hmm. and. I think that's not true to our experience. And, you know, I'm really inspired by Andrea Lawler. I just read an interview, um, Boston Review, and Andrea was talking about, like, how, how we break that, how mm -hmm. we actually, it's our responsibility to queer or fracture that. And that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that's actually what I am after, yeah. is to break the ABC. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's expected of the queer experience Absolutely. because people want to tidy it in a way that mm -hmm. we can more easily understand and grasp, but, but that's not the truth of it. Right. It's messy like every other, like heterosexual experience, mm -hmm. like a cis gender anything sure. experience. It's perpetu perpetual questions, it's perpetual violence, it's after, after, and before, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's on a continuum. Yeah, it's it's, on it's a continuum. not a, yeah. it's not a straight story. That's a nice story. way of putting it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't mean to use that pun, but it happened. <laughs> um, okay, Sasha asks, what's one thing that you've taken away from writing your memoir? Mm. Maybe multiple things, in case one is hard to... I think it... it go, I go back to that author's note, which I wrote towards the end of the process. I wish I knew that in the beginning, that the memory, again, uh, the color of your memory shifts depending on what body holds that memory, yeah. who holds it, and for how long, and how it's textured, and how it changes based on our traumas, based on our experiences, um, our backgrounds, our race. Like We bring all of that to mm -hmm. our memory. Mm -hmm. and. 
again, I think in the beginning, I, I had this false idea that success with this book would be accuracy. And it's not that at all. It's, it's what color we bring to that book, to that experience, and trying to, in kind of a kaleidoscopic way, consider other people's memories and experiences, but that we can't chase accuracy. Mm -hmm. That's not true. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. It's a romantic idea that we're trying to nail down an accurate experience on the page, but by rendering an experience as a work of art, you are changing it mm -hmm. um, by definition. Mm -hmm. And I think if I understood that earlier, it would have uh, offered me more freedom mm -hmm. to to embrace that uncertainty, to embrace the failure to get things right. Mm -hmm. I think I found that in the last section of the book, mm -hmm. which then recolors the rest of the book, but mm -hmm. um, I wish I knew that sooner. Yeah, I could see how that um, would have co both complicated and perhaps helped, especially you know in the sections when you write about being sexually assaulted and, mm -hmm. and then going back to the person who was involved and, and just like, you know, hearing how he, what his memory was, like mm -hmm. that to me felt like a generosity, but also like something that could be re-triggering and, mm -hmm. and really difficult to do, which is why maybe most sure. people don't do it. Yeah. I don't recommend that, by the way. <laughs> yes, I can imagine that it was, well, yeah, what was, why, why don't you recommend it? It. I mean, of course, every case is different, and, and maybe you're in a safe space or a relationship with that person to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I was not. I think I was chasing uh, pain because mm -hmm. I was in such a state of uh, acute pain after my father died, which is when we had that conversation. Mm -hmm. I was chasing answers mm -hmm. and pain in a way that didn't help mm -hmm. in any way. Mm -hmm. The box had actually closed. I had actually really truly healed and worked through what happened, and by opening it up again, bringing those people back into my life, um, it wasn't a safe move for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as writers and readers and artists, we're always chasing the story. Mm -hmm. um, we always want what's a more interesting story that we can follow in order to heal. Mm -hmm. And I think by finding that conclusion or answer, by talking to him, I was chasing the story instead of honoring what would be best for me mm -hmm. as a person. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't recommend that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's wisdom, you know, knowing, uh, I think that's also part of learning the memoir, especially when you're writing about things that are so tender mm -hmm. and vulnerable that, you know, like there's a way in which you can reopen the wound. Um, sure. And, and not necessarily protect your heart. Yeah, honor yourself before the story. Yeah. Because what makes for a better story usually doesn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. The unfinished story is the story, is kind of the lesson I learned in the book. That's a line in the book, and it's, I think, the, the thesis statement for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how long was the process in getting your work published? Um, I started publishing work in college was my first published piece when I was about 18 or 19 years old in the College Literary Journal and I continued submitting to literary journals for many, many, many years um, with hundreds of rejections in my submittable. They're all still there. And oh, you don't delete them? No. I, I hide them. them. So oh. I, sometimes I just, because I'm like, oh, I didn't get that's, it. That's, I don't, that's all I need to know. That's good self-care. <laughs> but no, it is good, I think, also to just have a record. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. people who, like, when they, they used to get the printed ones, they, people who would, like, write about, like, putting them up on walls I'm in their that office person. as motivation. I'm always that yeah, person. This is, that, this is the digital version of that. Yeah. yeah. I, I tend to live in my failures sometimes. <laughs> but they keep you humble, right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I have no problem with that. <laughs> uh, imposter syndrome every day. But Same. I, hundreds of rejections, but I just kept submitting. I kept doing the work. I'm so grateful that that work was rejected, that my early books were rejected. This was far from my first book. Yeah. Um, I wrote several novels in, in college, and in, I even wrote an early uh, memoir manuscript when I was a teenager. Um, but I wrote novels. I wrote short story collections in graduate school and after, and nothing stuck, nothing was really strong enough. Um, but I just kept honing my craft for, you know, 10 years before this book was published. Mm -hmm. 
and it took several months to find an agent. In some ways it took over two years to find an agent because I was working with one who ultimately decided this book wasn't right um, for her, so I started over mm -hmm. again. Um, and then I waited those months for the queries to come in and to start getting rejections and answers. And I went through the same process everyone else did, yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's such an honest answer in terms of the rejection. Sometimes you want so much to be published or you want your work in the world so much that um, you it can feel I know for me it's felt devastating to get rejections, but I'm also really grateful for the things that are not in the world that just weren't mm -hmm. ready to be in the world. Yes. Um, so that the thing that is finally like going to be the thing can actually make its way through. Sure. Um, so that's what you want to be sort of known for. That is advice I would always give is it's so easy to be seduced by the big P word of publication. And we want it so badly that sometimes we're willing to compromise our work or to publish something that's not ready or to publish something we, we don't love. Um, I was a guest lecturer at Rutgers University last night and someone said, I'm working on this piece. I really want it published. How do I go about it? And I asked some questions and I said, do you love it? Do you really love it? And she was like, uh, I think so. I think I'm starting to love it. And I said, if you love it, send it out. And before that, don't worry about it. Don't think about publication. Not until you can stand by what's in that piece. It's the only thing we can control. Mm -hmm. When we publish books, when we publish things in literary magazines, we can't control what people think of it, how they review it, how they market it, how they sell it. We can control what's in it. And that's what we can stand by. That's our integrity as artists. So mm -hmm. don't be seduced by publication. It will always come. There's no, this clock is, is a false, is a false one. Amy asks, what's a book you loved reading or thinking about that was outside of your comfort zone? Hmm. I feel like your comfort zone is really broad because you it have really so many is. different interests and It talents. really is. I think, I'll, I'll answer this question maybe in not the right way, but I think there's a pressure as a writer and as an author to always have the most um, intellectual response to that question. <laughs> yes. of, I have always want to think, like, what's the, what's the great Russian novel that I love when you're asked your favorite books or your most influential books? So I've recently began to own um, both the times that I don't have time to read yes. and the fact that I love to read children's books. Yes. Um, and that I think for a while I was too embarrassed to share that yes. because that's always a question in every interview. What are you reading right now? What are you reading right now? And you hear people, they list off 10 like incredible novels. And I'm thinking like, well, okay. And I did that for a while. I would choose what was on my nightstand, even if I wasn't reading it. But the more conversations I have, the more I realize like people have children, they have jobs, they have several jobs. Yes. Um, I've been on book tour. And when I'm honest with myself, I'm like, I'm reading a lot of takeout menus and emails oh. and interview questions. Fine literature and of our times. Yeah, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't make you a lesser reader or writer. Right, and just I like not writing every day, it doesn't make you less of a exactly. writer, right? And I like, think to, to break the romanticism again of, of what that means uh, is important to me. So mm -hmm. for me, reading children's books always brings me back in touch with why I fell in love with reading in the first place and also how to structure something in a page turning way yeah. with plot yeah. that I think in in high literature now we we get carried away with voice and um, and language I certainly do but when I go back to Encyclopedia Brown and the boxcar children like that's what had me turning a page mm -hmm. that's the the ABC plot that I can actually follow and learn from the yeah. most. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's real. I love it. Um, Donglin asks, what got you interested in photography? Mm, that's a great question. I, I've i always had cameras and I, I've always been taking pictures. I think my, my photos have developed uh, so much as I've grown, I've, I've been more interested in portraiture, and I think that's related to my writing as well. I'm always interested in a portrait of a person, um, a fully dimensional character, and I think that is also what changed my interest in photography. It went from sort of landscapes and things I thought were pretty 
to portraits to then later these multiple exposure photographs of people. I wanted different versions of the self, again, in a single frame. So I started overlapping those exposures, and that became more interesting and more textured to me. And that's what I aim for in my writing as well. But I can't remember the original spark mm -hmm. of interest in photography. Okay. Um, this, this is a second question about um, being a photographer and writer from Sean. Would you say you're a visual thinker? And how has photography helped in your writing, especially in this book about shifting perspectives? Yes, I think I'm definitely a visual thinker. Um, I love, my first love really is, is film. Um, film and photography as a way of, of narrative and storytelling. I went to school for, at Parsons School of Design for design and um, I studied images and aesthetics and I think, I, th I hope that translates in my writing that I'm always trying to world build and build images based on fine details rather than broad strokes. Mm -hmm. And the photographs are in this book. Mm -hmm. um, W.G. Sebald really taught me how to incorporate imagery in a book that didn't feel cliche or hokey or gimmicky. And so I tried to use them in the final section because I felt the scrapbooking together of images was just important as the conversations I had. And I wanted those two to be in play and conversation with one another. Yeah, and just to make a note about visual stuff, I will point out that um, T. Kira's nails are, match the book. Um, like, it's incredible. You can't really see the glory of the glitter <laughs> and the amazingness that is happening right here, but it is happening. Um, so it's another way in which um, you think visually, I think, and are on brand. Thank um, you. Peter asks, what type of, what other types of writing do you do? Fiction and nonfiction. I am no good at poetry in any way, but I love to read it. Uh, my partner is a poet as well, but um, mostly fiction, I would say. Cool. Yeah. Um, and Tiffany asks, "What's your favorite book?" And you sort of answered um, by not answering this earlier. My favorite question. book. My favorite book in the world is Linda Berry's Cruddy. It's a novel, it's a graphic novel. Um, Linda Berry is my favorite author, uh, living, uh, living or Dead. I love her so much. And I love, again, that, that play between images and writing. I think she's just the bravest, most incredible. And I use brave, not in, oh, it's so brave. She tells the story just like her sentences are brave. They're just yeah. so playful. She arranges words in a way that just makes my mind want to explode. I love everything about Linda Berry. I highly recommend any of her books. Syllabus is incredible for writing prompts, for, for prompts for anyone. Um, you don't have to be a writer. Just to get creatively thinking. Um, she's my hero. Wow. And Creddy is a really tragic but beautiful novel. It's my favorite book in the world. That's so cool. Um, Damaris Hill. Hi, Those Damaris. are my peoples. Love you too. We love you back. BFF. <laughs> Athena K. Sounds like a great read. Sounds like a great emotional read. I would agree. <laughs> um, I'm going to butcher your name. I'm sorry. My Bomb, Ricky Devi. I'm sure the readers will draw inspiration from your story. Thank you so much. I hope so. Jeff, there's a great section on your website where you have all these amazing links to friends and family. Can you tell us a bit about who's on there? Um, yeah, it's, it's always important to me as, as a teacher, a writer, activist, human, to, again, reach out and, and build community. So I liked, I think it was the, the writer Shelley Oria. I first saw her website had a list of, of friends and family that she mm -hmm. linked to. Mm -hmm. And I loved that idea of just saying, you know, here's everything from the lipstick I love to use, hi, uh, wildflower, <laughs> uh, to yes. writers I love, to their books, their organizations, um, everything from trans organizations to homeless organizations, uh, places I've worked with on the website. and places I wish I worked with, <laughs> and people who inspire me, organizations who inspire me. So if you ever just want to go through the link and see if anything resonates and you want to toss some coins their way or you're interested in reading their work or seeing their work, it's just a place for that to show my appreciation and my gratitude to those people. Such a great idea. I love it. I might borrow it. Um, 
I hope, I wish everyone had it so I could see, yeah. you know, who's what they village? care about. Like, yeah, who who's your, your village? Yeah, and like, For sure. Yeah, what are your, mm -hmm. what do you do aside from writing books and <laughs> um, exactly. taking pictures? Yeah, I love it. Um, Sasha asks, can anyone contribute to No Tokens or do you have to have writing experience? We will look at anything. We've published many people um, for whom it's their first publication of writing or art. We publish art as well. We're opening submissions in June, on June 12th. Okay. Uh, submissions are always free. And we're usually open for a month or two, we'll probably stay open for the summer. And we'll really look at anything. We've, we publish all genres. And I, use, uh, I always grumble when I use that word <laughs> because I think that's a marketing term. But it's a term for us to also organize how we look at submissions. Um, but we publish all genres and we always have an other box, so we've published everything from musicals to hybrid essays to text messages. Um, we'll really look at anything that moves us in some way. Cool. Uh, this is an amazing comment. Uh, Samantha Bermelin. Sorry if I butchered your last Sammy name. Sammy B. My mom shares with me what she took from each chapter as she's reading this book. It's so amazing and beautiful and full of your pain and truth. She's loving it. And I'm loving hearing her updates as she continues to read your story. Keep doing your thing. Thanks, Sammy B. You're an inspiration. <laughs> Jacqueline asks, what books and media have influenced your own writing? Mm. In, in the back of my book, I think Linda Berry, who I already talked about, Grace Paley and Heather Lewis. Uh, Grace Paley for her activism and her writing. Um, the way she wrote, I mean, she, she had her writing on like receipts and recipes on her apron as she raised children and, and remained an activist through and through. Uh, she's just one of my great heroes. And Heather Lewis uh, was a, a queer writer who struggled with depression and mental health issues. She published three books, uh, one of them posthumously, who her village published for her after she died because they said her books were too dark um, and too damning in some way. And I just think she's the realest deal writer and I wish more people uh, spoke about her work in the ways I think her work should be spoken about. And it sounds romantic and I'm always trying to break those metaphors, but it literally feels like you can feel the heat on her pages. Mm -hmm. There's nothing uh, pretentious or or even I don't know it's just real it's just the realest shit it's unfiltered <laughs> it's unfiltered it's the real deal um, the writer the author Alan Gargana said when he heard Heather Lewis read for the first time in school at Sarah Lawrence College uh, two sentences and I knew was his line and I always love that line because I think for our favorite writers sometimes we have that feeling, like two sentences in and you know that's your person. That's yeah. the real deal. Yeah. So I think those three writers are most important to me, I'd say. And mm -hmm. media, just films. I love films. Um, I'll watch any movie. I love, it's an easy way to consume structure and story and look at the shape of films and how they work. Um, everything from old silent films to I just saw Us and I loved Us. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Did you get it? Um, I'm, I still have questions. Same. I'm seeing it for the second time tonight. Okay. And I'm really excited for the second viewing. Yes. But my, my fiance, Hannah, she always gets things more than I do. So we laughed and she's like, oh, it's about this. It's about this. Oh, wow. I was like, okay. Cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We, I, me and my yeah, friend were totally She's my own Google for that. Confused. Yeah, yeah. So I have to see, I have to schedule my second viewing. Yeah. Um, Laura asks, since you're so visual and you love film, would you ever like to write for the screen or adapt your book for the screen? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Cool. That is my ultimate dream. Great. I've worked on films before, both short and feature films, but I've always worked in costume or one of the visual components for film in the background, but I would love to be involved in the writing process of film or television for sure yeah awesome hope it happens thank you smart smart film producers get on it um <laughs> sherry helms kokolsky sorry mm. about your last name you are sherry. amazing t care madden very well spoken it is true Love sherry and so we're going to wrap up um where can we find you on social media on the web where can we find your book Anything um, else you'd like to say? Book is in bookstores everywhere. If it's not at your bookstore or local library, please request it. That would be amazing. Um, I'm at TK Madden at 
Instagram and Twitter, T. Kira Madden on Facebook. Um, and I'm just about to post part two of my tour schedule. So if I'm coming to your city, please come out and say hi. I would love that. And I have events all over the place all the time. And I, I meeting everyone who's read the book or, or my writing is really my favorite part of doing this because it is for that outreach and for those conversations. So I would love to meet you. And yeah. I'm right. so happy to be here. Thank you for watching and thank you for having me. Of course. Thank yeah. you so much for watching. Take care. Bye the book. Bye.